Last week, we, uh, we looked at uh, Psalms chapter 22, or the first 18 verses of it. Does anybody remember what we talked about? Go ahead. Uh, predictions of crucifixion Christ. Yes. Elaboration. Um, his exact words. Uh, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are foreshadowed. Anything else? True, very true. Brother Junior, I think you had something to add. Well, no, I was just looking at the word warm there, and I, I, was, uh, I was thinking about what he said. He spoke something out that he didn't know about. Just, um, we kind of elaborated that uh, J- Jesus is suffering. Um, he, ab- he was abased to the point of being below man. He was... He was he be he became a worm to who became of that estate anyway to to pay for our sins. But something I noticed, and I don't think I pointed it out, but I meant to think about what I was going to say. But um, it said that he had awareness while he was on his mother's breast. So I think that he was fully just as cognizant as you and I, but in the form of a baby. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, he def he he he, de- he he definitely was two beings at the same time. So, I mean, the omniscience of being a of being God n- never left him. So, um, it, it does say in those verses uh, that um, he essentially threw himself upon the. Um, the mercy of God at that age because despite having God within this small contained uh, body, uh, infants and even small children don't have any physical capabilities. They're relatively weak and easy to um, easy to overpower. Um, and um, we cast into mind the uh, his deliverance from the slaughtering that Herod delivered on the children of Bethlehem. Anything else? What Larry was talking about there, uh, you think about it, that there was no change, there was no change in Jesus as far as from the time he uh, went in and came out of Mary at the the Mm bed. There was no change. Yeah, it, well, and and I, it, it's fairly evident, especially if you if you if you look at the account of him leaving his parents as a twelve year old boy, that he was that he was fully prepared to start his ministry as early as possible. The the problem was that that honestly, the real issue was John the Baptist wasn't ready yet. Uh, his forerunner had not started his work yet. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't believe that Jesus was getting his, the cart ahead of the horse. I think he just enjoyed sitting around talking with the the learned religious men of his time, and time got away from him for a couple of days. Um, well, but but he, his his shows that he was completely cognizant because as a carpenter's son, he had almost no education. Yeah, it it, it would have been it would have been limited. Now, uh, uh, Hebrew children were probably more educated than most because they went to synagogue. Um, uh, they, uh, but as far as far as ha- having the, I mean, it was it says in the scripture stuff that he he was he confounded a lot of these people with his not with his knowledge. He, it, 
at least at a twelve year old at, at the age of a twelve year old boy, we don't have any we don't have any record save except for for probably this little bit of foreshadowing in Psalms of what his cognizance was as a small child. Um, but uh, we know at least by twelve that he was that he was he was fully aware. So our assumption could be, which I don't like to assume with the scriptures, but our assumption could be that he was had his full faculties about him. Um, uh, but I think that's unusual. I, I, d- I doubt that Jesus received many lickings, though. Well, he uh, received none, actually. But I'm just, if he was sinless, that would have been an impossibility. The, the closest that he ever would have come probably would, would have been when he was 12, and that would have been just because his parents were angry because they didn't let him he didn't, they, he didn't let him know that he was gone. But he looked Mary right in the eye and said, i got to be about my father's business. Um, she knew. Oh, she did, she yeah. But um, my... Uh, uh, having been around my wife and and several other mothers, if your child ran away for twelve for uh, at, at twelve and then showed and you finally found them at church and said I'm I'm just I'm just getting ready to start the ministry, they're probably going to get a spanking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, th- there were some extenuating circumstances that went on with that too. Yeah, th- there was probably a ton of people that run run up from Nazareth. Probably a lot of his cousins. John the Baptist could have even legitimately been in, 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 uh, some people that he, yeah, people that he hung out with. Yeah, he could. He could. Obviously, Elizabeth and 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 Zechariah were both. Uh, they live in and around Jerusalem because he was a priest, but but they all had to come in for this celebration, so it's possible that they could have met up and talked this time. Yes. Yeah, it, it would have been very easy, especially with the number of people that were at that event, to to lose track of them. Yes, Jesus also had brothers and sisters, so of which he was the oldest. You would have, you would have, as the eldest child, you you you're, you're kind, you 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 get asked more than one time, "Where's your brother? Where's your sister?" Um, so why 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 did no one find? You know, I, 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 I did, and your answer was always yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, moving on from this, all right, so we talked extensively about the suffering of Christ toward the end of the um, toward the end of our reading last week, and we got to verse 18 where it says, "They part my go- garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture." Um, and this, of course, um, uh, foreshadowing what the Romans would do with his with his clothing. Verse nineteen reads in Psalm twenty two: um, "Be not thou far from me, O Lord; O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog." Now, verse nineteen um, is a refrain. For strength in these, and, and and really, we're talking about some of some of the final moments of Jesus's before he would he would die, before he would be resurrected, and he is asking for for strength from the Lord. Now, Jesus's resolve in his God person never wavered, ne- not for a second. Um, he had a covenant that he set up and that he set about to do, and there was there was nothing that was going to be able to stop him. 
But as we kind of stated last week, um, flesh, even Jesus' perfect flesh, is weak. It says after his 40 days and 40 nights and um, of, of fasting, and I'd be right there with him, he hungered. And at this point in his crucifixion, Jesus was past the point of physical capability. I don't think that he was asking, you know, a lot of time when we ask for strength through a problem, it's usually not physical that's, that, that's, the, that's the issue. Uh, or, or if we think that's the issue, it's just because we're, we're faithless. Um, because a lot of our problems are systemic to our faith, to the amount of faith that we have or the lack thereof. Um, the, the problem that Jesus was going through had nothing to do with... with he had resigned himself to this. The, the, the last attempt at avoiding this had been made at Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. He was, he was perfect, but he did not have the physicality to go any further. We talked extensively last week, and I won't go rehash it and go through it again, but the wounds that he had taken at this point would have killed most of us over and over again. There were single injuries that he took throughout his crucifixion that would have killed most of us. Or at least rendered us unconscious, but he was fully aware, and endured it all because he had to reach the point of it is finished. He had to endure a specific amount of suffering. We talk a lot about specificity in, in election, in salvation, in, in, in the, the number that he has chosen to be his. We talk about specificity in all, in all of this, but the amount of time that he must survive on the cross was just as specific. And I believe in this moment that he was literally asking for physical strength to endure the last few moments of his suffering and pain before he would die, before he would give himself up. And verse 20 says, oh, deli uh, and, uh, Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of unicorns. Now, um, there are, and we made a comparison last week that, that he had been rejected. By, by the time of his crucifixion, Jesus had been rejected by all, by his father, by his, by his blood people, the Israelites, by, by the Jews, and ultimately by the Gentiles, which are referenced, I, I believe, in this text as dogs. Now, you can use this uh, from the sword of the dog. This makes perfect sense with the rest of it, that he was wanting, uh, that he was wanting protection, and, and, and if you want to interpret uh, this scripture this way, um, I, I think you could even say that he didn't want them to take his life too suddenly. Again, he had to suffer an appropriate amount, uh, the the exact amount that needed to be. It, it's just like when Brother Brother Jarrett was talking about all the sacrifices. A lot of time, the, the blood did not need to be lost. You, it, it took every drop. So he want, he, but um, if you in, if you look at it in in Concord with verse twenty two, it starts talking about the lion. Um, and uh, Spurgeon actually, in in his commentary, may, uh, says that the dog here, as well as the lion in the following verse, could refer to the tempter. Now, there's a lot of I think false theology that would that would lead you to believe that the devil was excited upon Jesus's death, that the devil was happy that he was going to die, and and I, I think that's kind of short sighted because the the the, the devil's whole the, the first time we see the devil appear upon the scene during Jesus' ministry was for temptation. And what was he offering? He was offering a soft, easy path to what Jesus wanted to try to accomplish. If you just bend your knee, everything can be yours. Everything that's been set upon underneath my hand, I can give to you. That is within my ability as, as Satan. And so... I don't believe that the devil was very excited. The devil had to play his role. Why did, why did he enter Judas Iscariot? I, I think that was at the direction of God. Why did, God, why, did, why did Job get attacked? Because God brought that up. <laughs> uh, uh, have you considered my servant Job? And why did Jesus, Judas get entered? Because it was, that was the devil's duty. It was, it was the job that he wanted to play. But I don't think the devil was excited by 
the redeeming of a certain number of people that he could never touch ever again. I don't think he was happy about that, Brother Jim. Yeah, it, it's it, 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 there is a potential there, but I, I will I will offer a, a a counterpoint to to that though. I believe that the naysayers, the mockers at at the at, at the crucifixion that were calling for him to come down, if you, he he saved others, himself he cannot save. Uh, and, yeah, to yeah to uh, and uh, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If you will come down from the cross, then we will believe. That, that was the offering that was made by the Jews at that time. I believe that was Satan's... Off- very, it's very possible the devil didn't know what his role in this plan was because the devil is powerful but not omniscient. He does not know the plan of God. But interrupting this process could have been a role that he wanted to play. Again, from the very earliest part of, the, of Jesus' ministry, he had wanted to derail everything that Christ was wanting to do. Yeah. And Satan did know the coding of Angelium in Genesis 3.15. Right. He knew that the seed of the woman would come and he would crush his heel, or he would bruise his heel, but he would crush his head. I, I personally, this is my personal belief, believe that the devil was fully aware of what Jesus was and what his, what his duties here were. God had never visited the earth in the way that Jesus did. Right before in history. And that's why at the moment where he could have literally been his strongest or, or in, but also physically the weakest after this 40 days of fasting and communing uh, with his father and after he had just been baptized by John and his ministry was just fixing to get started, that who shows up on the scene? Not a demon, not, you know, so, not something that would tempt us. Right. The actual devil himself shows up. And I believe that at the cross that those people that called down, that was, an, that was another easy path. What did Jesus want to do? He wanted to save his people. And what they were saying was, if you'll come down, we'll believe. Potentially. But, 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 but he would... But he, yeah, the, t- it, it, the, the succumbing to the temptation would have been the fault. Something that Jesus could never do. Uh, so, um, in verses 20 and 21, I believe you're, you're seeing Jesus call upon... So, he, in verse 19, he's asking for physical strength, the ability to endure the pain. But I think there was a mental aspect in the, uh, to, to the cross where you have all these people... And we talked about the, the shaming that he took, especially being, being naked and probably, probably very bony. He didn't eat a lot through his ministry. Uh, uh, the, was it uh, the, 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 uh, the birds have nests and the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath no, not to where lay his head. He didn't eat a lot. In fact, him and his disciples would just walk through cornfields and get a little bit of grain rubbed off in, in their hands to eat. They, he was probably thin and, and, and gaunt by the time that he got to the cross. And, uh, and he was being shamed. So it was this mental aspect. And then you have the people that he was trying to save tempting him to come down from the cross. I will... Um, so in verse 21 kind of capstones the the end of Christ's suffering. Because in verse 22 in this chapter, you will see a turn. You will, you will see a leaving behind of suffering and a looking forward to better things, but also relating to Christ. And it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye um, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him all ye see, uh, all ye seed of Israel. Now, verse twenty-two says that I, I would, I would declare thy name in the midst of my brethren. Now, if you read John twenty, where he is resurrected and he talks to Mary Magdalene and he talk, and he appears to his disciples, he mentions my father mo- on multiple occasions during those entering. I, I think that verse twenty-two is actually talking about his resurrection. It's stuff that's going to take place after his his resurrection. Um. Then in verse 23, he talks about uh, all these, uh, uh, 
he's calling for praise for the Lord. And what is the reasoning? Well, verse 24 will give us the reasoning. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he uh, hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Now, you could say, well, that doesn't make sense because he did turn away from him. But let, let's, let's examine this verse very quickly. Uh, verse 24 is... It, it, he. Why are we praising him in, like he calls for in verse 23? Because he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. The sacrifice was perfect. God did not look down upon the suffering that he endured and said, well, you had all that sin on you, you probably deserved that. He looked upon his son's perfect work and then the affliction that he endured at the end of it and said, yes, this is good. This is good. And he says... Um, Neither hath he hid his face from him. Now, it does say in the scriptures that God, God turned away from him, but this is not an eternal looking away. This is not, a, this is not a, an inability to hide, to, uh, to, to find him again, because I think if you look at that in conjunction with the end of the verse, but he cried unto him and he heard. What did he cry? I, it, there's a lot of things that he cries on the cross. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He talks about his mo- he talks to John about his mother. He talks to uh, he he uh, he talks to the thief on the cross. Jesus says a lot of things, but there's one thing that I believe that God would have heard from him after God had turned 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 away from his son, and that is three simple words: "It is finished." God would have heard that. And if you look at the top of the verse where he's talking about the affliction of the afflicted, this makes perfect sense. Did God turn away from him? Of course he did. He could not look at the sin of you and I smudged all over his son. But that wasn't an eternal hiding of the face. That wasn't, that wasn't the ability to never see him again because he did hear him. When he said, it is finished, the price had been paid. The, 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 ultimate, the, the ultimate outpouring of grief and sorrow and blood had been atoned for. God, uh, th- there would be interaction between God and Jesus once again. In fact, if you look at what Mary says in the Garden of Gethsemane, or he says to Mary there, he said, I haven't ascended to my Father yet, don't touch me. So this interaction would take place again. He, did not, he, he, did not, he turned his back, but he did not hide his face. There's a, diff- there's a difference there. Um, verse 25, My praise shall be of thee in the congregation. I will pay my, bow- my vows before uh, them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your, ha- uh, your heart shall live forever. Now verse uh, 25 says that he would that he would. Uh, 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 my praise shall be thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. This completing of the covenant that the triune God made with them within himself for what? To redeem all those that he that he selected to be worthy. Not because they were worthy, that he deemed that he thought they were worthy of his eyes. And Jesus did that. He, I, I actually think that, that this, this completion of this vow, this completion of the covenant, would have taken place after he talked to Mary. He, his presenting of his affliction before his father and says, here's my blood, I'm pouring it out before you, this is what I did, I have completed the plan that we said that we were going to do, this, this, this thing that we set out at, in the book of Genesis to start, and now here, here it is complete. And that vow, this, these things that he could, it, it continues every time someone's saved. This work that he can, you know, Jesus' work is finished, the actual, the, actual, the actual bleeding of his blood, but every day a, a, a uh, result of this work can be found. I don't know if there's someone saved every day. I hope there is. That'd be, that'd be, a, that'd be a nice thing to think about, wouldn't it? Um, but, uh, uh, I, but, Every time someone's saved, the results of this completed work are found. And I think that's kind of talked about a little bit in verse 26 where it says, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. Now, who are the meek? Well, if you're saved in here, at one point or another in your life, you were meek. You were humbled. You were humiliated. You were groveling for mercy before the Lord God of heaven. 
And he reached down his hand and says, I'm, I'm going to give you something a little bit better than mercy. I'm going to give you my grace. And he lifted you up and he said, you're, 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 not, you're not just going to be a servant in my house. You're going to be a brother. You're going to be a kinfolk and I'm going to adorn you with a ring and a, and, and a coat and, and you're mine. And that's filling, the filling that you, you know, if, if, you've ever, if, you, if you've been saved, you know what I'm talking about, when this, this overflowing. And in fact, I think there's a little bit of a reference to this in our very own Lord's Supper, where in 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us that he said, take, eat, this is my body. Oh, I actually have the verse written down, hold on just a second, because it, it, it's, it's, um, um, uh, where did I write it down? Uh, uh, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We, we by extension, now I'm not a believer in transubstantiation where you know the bread and the wine actually become the body and blood of Christ, but I do believe that you are partaking in that sacrifice whenever you are saved, and it is enough. You are, what the actual wording is satisfied. Not, not, you barely made it. Not, it'll be good enough for now. Satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. There it is. The result of everything else that we've talked about in the previous part of the chapter brought to bear in... Six very short little words here. Your heart shall live forever. Eternal life. All the ends of the, wor er, er, of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among nations. Now, we talked, uh, we've talked a lot about early, earlier about the temptation and what did, what did the devil offer Jesus, the final thing that he offered before he left off from tempting him, he showed him all the nations of the world. He said, this will all be yours. What does Jesus earn by doing it the hard way? He says, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among nations. Now, there are two different ways to look at it. In fact, to business, the, the, one of the commentaries I read from Spurgeon says that he believes that this is, uh, can specifically be applied to missions, that, that we can go out and that we're going out and we're trying to teach and preach to as many nations, and I think that's mirrored in the New Testament where Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Um, uh, uh, but there's kind of a, a foreshadowing of the final kingdom here as well, where... where Quite literally, in flesh and blood, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And He, and he will rule and He will reign and everybody will be happy about it. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. No, that's not talking about the Baptist. Um, <laughs> uh this being fat, uh, if, if fact of the business, I think I've actually made this. If you if you were rotund in the Middle Ages, um, being fat meant that you were wealthy because there wasn't a lot of food in the Middle Ages. Um, um, that being fat is akin to being rich. If you were rotund, you were showing your wealth. I I have so much stuff that I can eat enough to gain weight is essentially is essentially the 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 thought pattern here. And what he's saying is that from the most powerful. To the least of all, what does he say? Shall eat and worship. All they, all, all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. He doesn't leave anybody out. He says, all they that go down to the dust. Like it or not, and I actually, we, I was talking to a fellow at, at work, and, not, and I said, he said, well, there, well, there's nothing that's sure. And I said, well, from my limited statistical knowledge, 100% of people die. All of them do. You can try to extend your life. You can put yourself in cryo-freeze. You can do whatever you want to do. But eventually, we all find our way to the dust. And, 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 and this verse is putting from the richest 
down to the very lowest. From I mean, And you can almost see this same type of comparison when Jesus did the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Everybody dies. It's the great equalizer. And none can keep alive his own soul. You can work. This verse refutes every other Christian like theology, every other uh, uh, religion that's out there. Buddhism, the Church of Mormon, Muslim. Nobody can keep alive their own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be counted, uh, accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born that he hath done this. Now, this is, this is the duty of those that, whose heart shall live forever. It says, A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. It's like, well, Brother Adam, lots of generations. There's many, I mean, there's been thousands of generations that have been saved. But it, it's all a single generation of the Lord because we're all His brothers and sisters. It's a single generation. And that generation is supposed to go out and declare His righteousness. That generation is supposed to go out to the next bunch of people that are born. I see three, four small heads back here. Eli was hidden behind Mamaw for a minute there. Um, of people, those are the people that we have to get to. It is, it is the final duty, and it's, it's very interesting that in the in, comp, in compilation of Psalm 22, if you look at it from, from, from the very first verse to the very end verse, it is the gospel bore out before us. And just like the actual gospels that we get in the New Testament, the final word is go, tell somebody about it. I'm very, very suspicious of saved people that want to keep everything all bound up inside of them. It should, it, it, sh, it should churn in our gut to get us to go out and do something for people, to tell people about the Lord, to, to let Him know that there was someone who bled and died. And you know, it's, 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 it's kind of, it can be different. And, and, and now I wouldn't even do difficult as the word, but it's, it's just odd sometimes in, in a place where everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody can tell you about uh, uh, the guy that died on the cross. Uh, every, you know, the, up here on the highway, uh, if, if, after you pass the dollar store up there in Big Rock, there, there's a big sign with, 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 with a, a image of Jesus on a cross, and, and everybody knows that story. But it's, it, is to, it is left to you to make it, to make it real for people to get down on their level and find them. And we're supposed to be going out and looking for these people. They're not branded. They're not marked. Uh, can, can I beg someone to, to, uh, to, to Jesus? No, but I can beg them to listen. I can impress upon them the need of their salvation and that it's not just a story that's been told a thousand times to them while they were in Sunday school or while they were in, in, in vacation Bible school. There's some effectiveness there. There's a real change in people's life that can be gained that way. I've told it many times before, and I don't tell it to, to bolster, but my parents coming to me before I was saved and impress upon me the need to focus on my soul was an important piece of moving me toward my salvation. It, it, it clicked in my small nine-year-old brain that, hey, if my parents are concerned about this and they're concerned about so many things, maybe it's time for me to be concerned too. And we've got to, we've got to do that very same thing. We've got to find these people. Because the the time the and it, we may we may be here yet another two thousand years. It, the New Testament Baptist Church might be a ruin that archaeologists are digging through and say, well, boy, this they sure had a lot of folding chairs in this time period. <laughs> that may that may come to pass, but you you know what? It's been two thousand years since our Lord died, and resurrected. And if it's two thousand years yet again, that means we've squandered. 2,000 of the 4,000 years we have left. And a generation is dying away. The woke generation is dying away because we're, we're too scared of being 
fanatical or being uh, or being labeled as anything specific. Uh, uh, what should drive us and what drove our Lord to do this thing is concern for the souls of the people that we that we live, that we work with, that we see about us. Because everyone may be an infidel, and I think we're we're most often as Baptists trained to look at the world with those blinders. Every one of them may be an infidel, but what if they're not? What if we do nothing and we're wrong? Any questions or comments on the last uh, 19 through 31 of Psalm 22? Brother Larry. Yep. I, I think uh, verses 26 and 27 are, are extremely important. I think the, the spirit of pessimism that so characterizes a lot of our thinking these days, we, we don't understand what that, those verses are teaching. And there's verses like verse 27 scattered all throughout the Bible. And uh, I concur that you won't see a perfect fulfillment of that until the end of this age. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, a natural reading of the text. I mean, verse 26, that's a present reality, right? The mm -hmm. meat shall eat and be satisfied. That's happening right now. So why is verse 27 not happening right now? You know, And uh, I believe that it's a promise that will be fulfilled. And I think that it, for the last 2,000 years, it has been being fulfilled. It started out in Jerusalem, and now you have churches all over the world. The gospel is being preached all over the world. And Sure, the last 50 years in America might, might have been a little rough. It's lackluster. And we're definitely on a, I, 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 give, I give you that, we're definitely on an ebb. But I, I think if you look at history, it's not like this, it's like this. Mm -hmm. But it is going up. So we might be on a slope the last 50 years, but I believe that, um, we, that things will turn up. I, I don't believe that it's just going to be dismal and gloom and doom, and we'll never see verse 27 until the Lord returns. Yeah. Well, he he is the ultimate enforcer of his own <laughs> of his own design. Um, but if you take if you take the verse also, you know, it says that that the Lord knows about other people, but He only knows knows His people. All the ends of the world have already praised Him. Um, they have because He doesn't know anybody else. You know. Uh, it, We have we we have been uh, very blessed to, for especially specifically English, to be nearly a universal language with which everybody speaks and everybody has had an opportunity to hear the gospel. In most tongues, I I, I it, you you'd be hard to find a place where somebody hasn't shared the gospel yet. Be hard pressed to find it, um, and those that have been saved, they're doing what's in verse twenty seven. It's it's a it's a is a just like you said, you said, well, verse 26 is a present reality. Verse 27 is a continuing right. present, present reality as well. It's just like we say that uh, the doctrine of election is our encouragement to mm -hmm. evangelize because we know for sure that, that there will be people saved, right? Well, I, I look at something like verse 26, and you see in other places like Psalm 2 where it says, Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. I look at that as a great encouragement for missions and church planting because you know that it's a, hey, it's only a matter of time before China is a Christian nation. It's only a matter of mm -hmm. time before Tennessee repents. <laughs> right. So well, you, and 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 verse twenty, verse twenty two should I mean verse twenty two, verse twenty seven should also. Um, well, I done lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, yes. Um, It's very easy to be to look at a verse like verse twenty seven and become hard shell. Look at Revelations and say, right. okay, well, it's all going to get fulfilled anyway. Right. And the reason it's easy to become hard shell is because being hard shell is incredibly lazy. Right. <laughs> well, the way I look at it is, we as the kingdom of God, our commanding general, he put us on a mission, and we already know we're going to be victorious in the mission. So what we need to do now is just go fight it. Paul, I think, in his own in his own ministry, said that bodily exercise profiteth little. But he always, in a much of much of his writing, compares us to what athletes right. and soldiers. Right. Those are f moving people, people that get out and do things. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comment, brother Jared? Did I see your hand up? 
Okay, all right. All right. If there's nothing else, we will push into uh, Psalm 23 next week, a very familiar little piece of Scripture. We probably should be able to burn through that pretty fast. Have a good week. Thank you.